الله وبركاته نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Now before Rabi Lawal, of course, this is Rabi Uthani. And, you know, we had been for the for two months straight talking about the background to Imam Hussein al-Islam and what happened in Karbala. Uh, and as I say, you know, and we really just started skimming the background. Uh, and then we got to, you know, Rabi Lawal came and so we shifted gears and talking about uh, Rasulullah so some directly uh, and then last week we spoke about Sayyidatul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullah and as I mentioned last week from today moving forward we will get back to Imam Hussein al-Islam and Karbala and talking about Imam Hussein al-Islam is in fact talking about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he says uh, Al Hussein o Minni, wa ana min al Hussein. That Hussein is from me, and I am from Hussein. So, the character, the actions, the outlook—you know—all of these aspects overlap. You know, everything that Imam Hussein al Islam is, is a reflection of Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is also why Rasulullah said, you know, about his two grandsons, Hassan and Hussein salam, that they are the leaders of the youth of Jannah. And the interesting point here is that everybody in Jannah will be a youth. You know, when you enter Jannah, everyone's a youth. And he says they are the leaders of the youth of Jannah. And another narration where you know, people would speak about Ali, radiallahu anhu. Uh, you know, if you look at the original, you know, those who are what the Quran refers to as awwalun, I mean, the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu who accepted Islam right away, uh, and in Makkah, when when there was nothing to gain by becoming Muslim. You know, in fact, from a worldly standpoint, there was everything to lose. And we see that, you know, they gave up their lives, their wealth, everything for the sake of Allah and His Messenger. When you look at their attitude toward the household of Rasulullah, you know, like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Abdul Rahman, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, Talha bin Ubaidullah, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, radiallahu anhum. You know, if you look at the closeness that they had with the household of Rasulullah so it's, uh, it's mind-boggling as to how much love there was. When we had people who came into Islam later, you know, when basically all of Arabia now is falling under the feet of Rasulullah and, and so now you have people coming into Islam who don't understand things as well. So now you have people who, when they would see Ali, you know, they had issues with that, with his position. And this is why Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to say, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَى فَحَادَ عَلِيُّ الْمَوْلَى This hadith is the most mutawatir hadith of all hadith. 
Mutawatir means consensus, something that all of the companions agreed upon. As far as hadith are concerned, you know, if you look at most hadith, you have maybe one or two narrators as far as the companions. When you have mutawatir, you have multiple narrators. And this hadith where Rasulullah said, Man kunta mawla, that for whomsoever I am his mawla. For him also, Ali is his mawla, his protecting friend. His friend, his, his, and, and mawla is more than just friend. You know, and we use that term very loosely, unfortunately, these days. Oh, just, you know, he's my friend. You know, he's not a friend, he's an acquaintance. A friend is somebody who has your back. Who, when you start to, to uh, deviate, he puts you back straight. So this hadith of Rasulullah is so mutawatir that you have at least 30 different narrators from the companions themselves who said, we heard this from Rasulullah And saying this in front of thousands of different companions, all of whom said, yes, we agree with this. And this is the only hadith of Rasulullah which is narrated by all 10, ten Ashra Mubashra. All 10 of those for whom Rasulullah said that this one is Jannah and he is from Jannah and he is from Jannah and he is from Jannah and all of the 10 of them. Even though we know all of the companions of Rasulullah are for Jannah. But these have a special rank among the companions. So there are people who would, you know, again, these are people who just came into Islam who did not understand, or their level of understanding is not like those who are awalun. And again, you know, you, you know, people try to argue that, oh, you know, they try to make it seem like everyone's understanding is the same, and it's not, not even among the companions of Rasulullah And this is part of the mercy of Allah. So when they would look at Ali, they'd have some hesitation about his position. So one time, Someone, you know, Ali Radhuan came to Rasulullah and he had this sad face. And Rasulullah asked him, Oh Ali, why are you so sad? He says, Ya Rasulullah, people look at me with animosity. You know, another say hadith of Rasulullah where he says that only a believer loves Ali and only a munafiq or a hypocrite has animosity against him. But here he says, oh, Ali, don't be sad. Because the first four people that will enter Jannah are my, is myself, Rasulullah you, Ali, and Hassan and Hussein. And then along with us will be our offspring. And then our wives, or our women, and then those who love us. So because of this, you know, as we've mentioned many times before, there are only two companions of Rasulullah who if anybody criticized them or brought a complaint to Rasulullah about anything, he would never hear them out. In fact, he would chastise the one who was complaining. That is Abu Bakr and Ali. Radiallahu. If anybody said any little thing against them, you know, the one who complained against them was the one who was going to get chastised by Rasulullah. So Ali, I mean, Imam Hussein al Islam, of course, is the son of Ali. But the companions all refer to him as Ibn, Ibn Rasulullah, the son of Rasulullah. And when Rasulullah says that, that he is from me and I am from him, uh, it's one thing, you know, the son is from the father, but the father is not from the son. You know, this is Rasulullah is showing us the position of Imam Hussein al Islam. And when somebody does something, you know, their action is in, accord, in accordance with their position. The significance of what someone says or does 
is in line with the significance of the one saying it or doing it. The Quran is significant, why? Because it is the word of Allah. The narrations or the hadith of Rasulullah and the actions of Rasulullah are significant, why? Because these are the narrations and the, of, of Rasulullah So for the one whom Rasulullah says that he is the leader of the youth of Jannah. So if we want to be one of those who are in Jannah, we, want to follow, we need to follow our leader. The one for whom he says that he is from me and I am from him. Then what about his action? The significance of that action of his is in line with the status of that, that one. And when we look at the status of Imam Hussein al-Islam, Imam Hussein al-Islam is the one for whom Rasulullah left the member while he's giving the khutbah to pick him up and bring him up to the member. You know, the khutbah for Juma is part of the salat. We don't leave the salat just to go because some child comes into the room. Yet for Imam Hussein al-Islam, Rasulullah leaves the khutbah, picks him up, brings him up to the member. When he's riding, he, he picks him up and places him on his shoulders and he's riding around and Umar, he looks at this and he says to Rasulullah he says, Ya Rasulullah what a beautiful ride. You know, Rasulullah is, is the ride for Imam Hussein al-Islam. Imam Hussein al-Islam is on his shoulder. And he says, Umar, he says, oh Ya Rasulullah, what a beautiful ride. And Rasulullah says, what a beautiful rider. Again, he is the one for whom Rasulullah lengthened the sajda. You know, in salat, you know, the imam, if you look, if you, if you look at the etiquettes of leading the salat, Rasulullah said do, for the imams that they should not burden the followers. Don't make your salat so long that people get tired. You know, when you make sajda, the sajda should be, you know, it should be normal. It shouldn't be like, like you know, chickens pecking. You know, you go down and up. This is stealing from the salat. But at the same time, in, in jamaat, you know, if you're making salat by yourself, you make it as long as you want. But in jamaat, the imam is not allowed to make an extra long sajda. Otherwise, he may be burdening, especially the older people. You know, to the extent that people would come and complain because someone was leading salat somewhere else and they would come and complain to the Rasulullah oh, he makes this salat so long, and the Rasulullah would call them and say, don't make it this long. Do not burden the people. Yet when Imam Hussein al-Islam comes, when he's three or four, and Rasulullah in the position of sajda, and Imam Hussein al-Islam climbs upon his shoulders, the sajda continues and continues and continues to the extent that the companions said that we were, we were afraid that something had happened to Rasulullah. Oh, and then finally, when Imam Hussein al-Islam himself gets off, then Rasulullah comes up from the sajda. And when the companions ask, Ya Rasulullah, so son, what happened? He said that I did not want to trouble Imam Hussein. I did not want to give any trouble to my, my Hussein. This is, this is the love Rasulullah has for Imam Hussein al -Islam. To the extent when Jibreel al -Islam came with the, with the angel of rain, you know, the angel of rain had never been on the earth before. You know, again, these hadiths are saved. Even according to the group that, that tried to belittle or downplay the status of Imam Hussein al -Islam. even according to their scholars, these hadiths are saying. That when this angel came, because he wanted to meet Rasulullah And why did he want to meet him? You know, it's interesting, if you read the nar narration completely, Rasulullah is in the house of Umm Salma, his wife, Umm Salma, the mother of the believers, radiallahu anha. And he says to her that Jibreel has come to meet me, you know, with an angel who has never come to the earth before. So you stand at the door and don't let anybody in. This is a secret, secret meeting here. No one comes in. 
So she stood at the door. <laughs> Imam Hussein al-Islam, who at this time is, probably, is roughly about five years old, he comes running and she says, she stops him. She says, you can't come in. Rasulullah says, no one is to come in. He says, this is the house of my, my, my grandfather. He gets through her legs and he comes on in. Jabir al-Islam, he looks at him and he looks at Rasulullah so He says, Ya Rasulullah, do you love him? And Rasulullah so says, I love him. And then he says that your, your ummah, or people from your ummah, will kill him. And of course, when they do this action, then they're no longer from the ummah, as we understand the ummah. And they are no longer Muslim. But they're still claimed to be from the ummah. And we'll talk about this a lot as we go along. You know, because among those who killed him, there were those who used to lead Salat in the Masjid. There are so many fuqaha, so many hafiz of Quran, scholars of the time. And yet nothing was here, everything was here, just on the lips, nothing in the heart. And so when he says this, tears start to flow from the eyes of Rasulullah. So, of course, Rasulullah already knew even before Jibreel, but you know, sometimes you're told something that, that reinvigorates uh, you know, an emotion. You know, you know, like, you know, like for people who's, who've had close relatives who passed away. And you know this all year long that, oh, they passed away. But then certain times come and suddenly the emotions change. Or somebody says a word and suddenly you know, tears start to flow again. And so the tears are flowing from Rasulullah Sallallahu And then he says to him, he says to Jibreel Islam says to him, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I can bring you some of the dirt from the place where they will, they will shed his blood, where they will martyr him. And he goes to Karbala and he brings the dirt. And he gives it to Rasulullah Sallallahu and Rasulullah Sallallahu he gives, again, this is all in the narrations, this is all in the hadith. He gives this to Umm Salma, who keeps it in a jar, and Rasulullah Sallallahu tells her, when this turns to blood, you will know that they have killed my grandson. The reason the angel of rain came, and we'll talk again more about this as we go on, and reason he never came before, and the reason he came now was that he wanted to ask forgiveness from Rasulullah for something that is to happen in the future. Because when Imam Hussain al-Islam will be in Karbala, there will be no water. The Euphrates will be right there, yet the army of Yazid will keep them from getting any water. Of course, rain could come. And the army of Yazid has no com control over the rain. Yet the will of Allah is something different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to see the status and the position of His Hussein. You know, Ismail when he was thirsty, as a baby and his mother is running from Safa to Marwa and back and forth and then his heels are rubbing on the on on the uh, sands of Makkah and what gushes forth except Zamzam again this is the blood of Rasulullah Sallallahu if he had wanted to the same thing could have happened here But Allah SWT says what? وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Glad tidings to those who are patient. These are the people who know the will of Allah and they bow themselves to that will. <coughs> At the expense of everything else in this world. But they are not willing to give up the love of Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu for, for For even a, a, a moment.
You know, when Rasulullah Sallallahu he said, and the narrations are through Abu Hurairah, Radiallahu as we know, is he was famous for making the dua, Oh Allah, do not allow me to see this year 60 Hijri. This was a dua that he would make even in the marketplace. Wherever he was, he would make this dua, Oh Allah, do not allow me to see the year 60 Hijri. And when the people asked why, he said, I do not want to see the kingdom of the boy. And the boy, the term that's used because Rasulullah had told him, he said that, that these hoodlums, and that's also kind of a, a mild term for the actual term that, that was used, will sit on my member and they will make a mockery of it. And when Rasulullah he said that these hoodlums will do this and they will rule. And they asked, Ya Rasulullah what do you mean by these hoodlums? These boys. You know, if you look at Yazid, when he became king, he was in his mid-thirties. And if you look at the rest of Banu Umayyah, with the exception of Marwan, all of them were twenties, thirties. And they became kings. <coughs> so they asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, what does this mean? He said that if you obey them, if you follow them, then you will lose your religion. And if you do not follow them or obey them, then you will lose this world, meaning that you will be killed or your, your wealth will be taken and all of the difficulties will come upon you. You know, like Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jilani, he said that the time will come when the, when the world will be full of dogs. And you have two choices. Either you eat, run and eat with the dogs, or the dogs eat you. And it is better if the dogs eat you. At least you die with your iman, which is everything anyway. You know, it's not at least you die, you die with your iman. You should die with your iman. That is everything. So this is why when Yazid becomes the king, end of the year 60 Hijri, Rajab, 22nd of Rajab of this year 60 Hijri, Imam Hussein al-Islam leaves Madinah Munawwara and comes to Makkah. And then in Makkah, you know, he's sent all of these letters from the people of Kufa. Kufa is an interesting place. <coughs> It's important, in order to understand all of what, what's going on, you have to also understand the history of Kufa. Kufa is a military city, a military town. You know, it was established during the Khilafah of Umar, radiallahu anhu. You, know, you had a small, I guess, township or, or locality there before. But during the time of Umar, radiallahu you had these armies coming through. So this became their staging area. This is where they would, would take a break and, and rest. So it became the city, a big city because of this. During the Khilafah of Ali, yeah, and well actually before this, during the Khilafah of Umar, radiyan, when the city is established, Umar radiyan, sends Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyan, to Kufa to be the governor of Kufa. Abdullah ibn Masood, if you look at the companions of Rasulullah as far as the recitation of the Qur'an, he is number two. And that is, he, and he learned 70 surahs of the Qur'an directly from Rasulullah as far as the pronunciation. If you look at, you know, like, like uh, schools of, of Tajweed, uh, many of them have a connection with Abdullah ibn Masood. <coughs> So he learned 70 of the surahs from the Rasulullah directly. He learned the rest from Sayyidina Ali. So he's number two. Number one, of course, is Ali. Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun But Rasulullah said that I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its door. 
So, of course, when he comes as the governor of Kufa, he brings with him all of this knowledge. So, Kufa becomes a center of knowledge. And then when Ali Radun becomes the Khalifa, he transfers the, the capital from Medina because he wants to get all of this, and we've talked about this before, he wants to get all of, all of this uh, uh, trouble and turmoil that's going on out of the city of Rasulullah so and, and, and take it away. So he brings this, the capital to Kufa. And of course, he is the door of knowledge. He is the door to the city of knowledge, so he is that door. So again, imagine the level of knowledge that is within Kufa. Knowledge means nothing without sincerity. Abu Jahal, before, before he became Abu Jahal, among the Quraysh and even after Islam, among the Quraysh, he was known as Abu al-Hakam, the father of wisdom. You know, Quraysh wouldn't do anything unless they consulted him. And he knew who Rasulullah was. He knew this is the Messenger of Allah without a doubt. Yet he chose to oppose him. Which is why he goes from being Abu al-Hakam to Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance. The father from being the father of wisdom to the father of ignorance. Because he knew and still he rejected just because somebody knows something up here doesn't mean that it's come here to the heart. You know something in the head doesn't mean anything in the heart unless you make that transfer. And this is why Rasulullah what did he say? Famous hadith which is in pretty much all of the books of hadith, Bukhari, Muslim and anyone else. Tirmizi, Nisai, Abu Dawud, various, various forms of narration. But if you look at the gist of everything, it's all the same. Which is that a people will come from this Ummah. Who will, and saying this to Umar and Ali and Khalid bin Walid, that, that people will come whose recitation will be so, uh, that will, they will recite the Quran in such a way that you will be ashamed of your recitation. But it will not get below there. All around. And they will think that it will testify for them in the hereafter, but in actuality it will testify against them. And your salat will be insignificant to theirs, and your uh, saum or your, fa your uh, fasting will be insignificant to theirs. And in the end, what does he say, especially in the hadith and say Muslim, he says, and if the people knew what reward I would give them for fighting against such a people, they would think that that one action of theirs is enough to enter Jannah. And again, these are people who are reciting the Qur'an. They are saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad And if you look at them historically and even today, you know, same <coughs> ideology, same mindset. And just like back then, they would say, Oh, ulil amri minkum. Allah commands that you obey those who are appointed above you, your leaders. This is what Banu, the, these hoodlums of Banu Umayyah were saying. You know, this is what the kings of today say. You know, you look at the kings in the Middle East. They claim to be kings. All of them are tyrants. What do they say? Oh, well, amru minkum, and they have their fatwa machines. You know, the scholars that they paid off. Ah, see, you got to listen to him. <coughs> same exact thing. And the reason we fall for the same trap is we don't know what happened before. We've forgotten. We choose to ignore it. And our connection with Allah and His Messenger is not pure. So we fall for anything and everything. I will end here today with this. We'll continue next week, inshallah. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, we haven't even gotten to the steps Imam Hussein has found is taking. So, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts with his true love and the love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go ahead and make sunnah. And we'll do it for them, inshallah.